So, so my, my day to day work is, is programming, .NET, Java, TypeScript, uh, primarily in the digital marketing space, that's like websites and apps. So I, I come to this, when I give this talk, not as a security expert, although I, I do it quite a bit, but as a day to day developer, I needed to learn how to do stuff that I wouldn't um, necessarily expose customers to risk. And more importantly, that I wouldn't end up on the headlines as some company we were working for accidentally exposed 8 million social security numbers or credit cards or, or whatever, right? Um, so that's how I came to it. And what I've discovered is over the years, um, it turns out that to this day, most companies are pretty terrible at security, and that's evergreen. We'll get to some examples of that. So here's what I can help you with what OWASP is. So OWASP is a, uh, it's an open source, it's a free 501c3, it's a nonprofit organization. Therefore, it was founded quite a long time ago, in 2001, and their sole purpose is basically, let's get some really smart security people together, let's come up with some good best practices for developers and other people to use, and let's help fill, fix the awful state of web security. That was in 2001. Um, they've done good work, but we're still, it's, it's, it's been a rough 17 years, and it continues to be a rough 17 years. Um, so they have a number of projects. Besides what I'm talking about now, which is the top 10 security vulnerabilities, they have a really cool zap attack proxy project, like an open source like um, security scanner. You can scan your sites for vulnerabilities. They have a bunch of cheat, cheat sheet series. So if you're like a Java or a .NET developer, or you're like, hey, how do I put my password securely and stuff like that? OWASP has cheat sheets. You just go over them, do exactly what they say, you'll be a okay, right? Which is kind of the purpose of the organization. But today we're going to talk about the top 10. So the top 10, this one we're talking about today, just came out. It was October of, of last year that the final thing passed RC and was announced. Uh, it replaces and supersedes the previous version, which had been from 2013. So the top 10 is the top 10 most common vulnerabilities right on the web today. And, and they, they have this fairly strict methodology of how they rate most common, um, as well as why they rank number one versus number 10. And it comes down to this chart, right? So it's, it's how easy it is to attack, how prevalent it is, how easy it is to attack, and the possible impact. And they use those to determine what's number one versus what's number 10. Okay? So there is a, there is a methodology behind the madness. It's not just some random person deciding, nah, this is the worst. Um, and and it's, it's open source, and there's a whole RC process. Actually, the 2017 was so sort of controversial. If you take a look, um, there is a GitHub project, I'm going to split back here, that has all these examples on here. Uh, you'll actually see some commits from here the last two weeks because I had to modify the talk because they changed two of the vulnerabilities recently. Um, but the primary purpose of the top 10 is to make sure that everybody who works in software, whether that's an educator, a designer, an architect, a programmer, whatever, um, they know the consequences of what happens, right? It's designed to be educate you at a very high level and then let you dig into it if you need to. It, basic techniques to protect against these high risk problem areas. Most of these problems that we're going to go over are really easily solved. Most of them. And uh, provide guidance on where to go if you can't solve them, you can't really get them. So, here's the top 10 that we're going over. Um, some of these Probably the, the newest ones, if you guys are familiar with the old version of the list, the, the 2013 version, the, the new stuff you're going to see on here, you probably haven't seen before, are XML external vulnerabilities, uh, insecure deserialization, and insufficient logging and monitoring, which I like to call that one the Snowden rule, if you guys are familiar with uh, NSA's Edward Snowden. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's, that's why that one got put on there. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, everybody's personal favorite. Been the number one for four consecutive lists in Junction. Uh, yeah, three times. Or three times champion. I thought it was in 2005, too. So, I just noticed the slides getting cut off. Hmm. Um, so, Injection talks about, we're probably most familiar with it with SQL injection. A SQL injection attack. It also occurs, there's a couple of other um, types of injection attacks, XPath injection. If you guys are, are working with LDAP data sources like Active Directory or anything else up there, you can have LDAP injection attacks. So there's quite a few different ones. Um, the reason it's rated so high is its exploitability is severe. 
Um, it's basically when anybody can send arbitrary data to an interpreter and have them be executed. Okay? So what this usually involves is you have something that takes input. Um, most commonly, we refer to in a web form. Right? We have some sort of web page that takes some user input. And by crafting some, some technique of some kind, you can cause that to be executed as like a simple <coughs> command, which can cause all sorts of drastically, usually terrible results to your users. Um, they are very prevalent, especially in legacy code. Um, from a personal example, I see, a, I see a SQL injection about every quarter to every two or three months when I look at arbitrary code. You know, I, I do a lot of clients across the world, and it doesn't matter how big they are. I'm talking Fortune 10 companies to you know, the smallest little ones, you will see SQL injection or active or LDAP injection in people's code all over the place. Um, they are also very easy to discover. Once you get your mind or what happens, it becomes like second nature to flip and find them. So they are somewhat easy to detect, which is nice. Um, how are they impacted severe, right? So usually, usually when you have access to an injection attack, you can do anything arbitrary to a database or a LDAP or whatever it is, next path, and that's usually pretty terrible. So from personal experience, I always have notes down, and it always changes. Every time I give this talk, because every couple months, I always have new examples. So uh, three months ago, on a American Fortune 300 company, they make tires. Um, I discovered a SQL injection attack on their primary method for customers to log in and authenticate. Right? So that was just a couple months ago. It was, it was really easy. So you could just type in anything one of their and you execute know, SQL against their users table effectively. So you can dump the entire thing and then you have access to their entire customer database as well as their usernames and passwords. If you craft your passwords, we'll go over that too. Um, I myself, when I was a very baby junior developer, um, used to work for a state government back in the States. And I accidentally coded an XPath injection, or an LDAP injection path in a utility or help desk use that had someone been smart enough, they could have arbitrarily executed LDAP against any of the Active Directory and gotten access as like a domain admin if anybody's from the Active Directory. I, I fixed it. But uh, the whole point is these can be easy if you don't know what you're looking out for. Like, if you don't have that security mindset and realize, like, wait, this is bad, this would be pretty easy to accidentally make a really terrible problem because it's one of the first things attackers try to do. So let's go into what an injection is going to be. Um, I'm going to show you what it looks like first. Let me flip over to my, there we go. So I have a, oops. I am going to, let me turn off, do that one. There we go. Okay. So I have a, this is that web project that we'll show it. Uh, it's actually running in debug mode. It, it is a extremely simple web app, um, which has just like it's a it's mostly a blog, quote unquote. So it is a demo around what these attacks look like. Um, but yeah, you can create new entries and use an in-memory database, so you don't have to have any setup or anything like that. You don't play around with yourself after you're done. So for SQL injection attack, here's what this looks like. Stop debugging this. I have a cheat sheet comments. Because I can never run it. Alright. So we have a comments controller. And this comments controller, hopefully, uh, hopefully I approach is most people here .NET developers? Most folks? Okay. If, if hopefully you're a Java dev or something like that, um, I, I try not to use anything that was too complex. So you know if you're familiar with some of the other languages, it should look hopefully fairly similar from there. Um, so this is a, I'm gonna create a comment. Okay, that's all this action does, right? It takes user goes on the blog, types in some stuff, posts the data here, it takes it in, and it creates a comment. Unfortunately, this right here allows arbitrary SQL injection. So what happens, what I mean by that, is I'm taking in probably JSON data, right? It's got an ID, a body, and an author as my comment. I then go ahead and insert it into my SQL database. Insert into comments, ID, author, out, and my values. So I'm not escaping those. Comment.id, comment.body, or comment.author. Which means I can just add a couple of back ticks and start doing stuff like drop tables, comments, or inserting arbitrary data into your SQL comments, or select star from comments, or select star from users. This right here allows anybody who figures it out to execute arbitrary SQL running as whatever this app pool is running, or whatever this SQL connection string is running as. Um, this is terrible, and I see it all the time. 
Uh, and you'll see it not just in not just for SQL, but again, XPath, LF, and anything that, that takes user data and does it escape it or insert it or use it in a safe manner. Okay. So the question is, what is a safe manner? How do, how do we fix this, right? Every language is different. Um, the easiest thing for most languages nowadays, if you're, if you're touching like a database, right, is to use store procedures for SQL, um, parameterized queries again for SQL. Um, or if you're using almost all the ORM frameworks, option relational mappers, like if you're a .NET developer in any framework, if you're a Java developer in Hibernate, um, if you're a JavaScript developer, Breeze, actually. Uh, although while you're coding in ORM and JavaScript, uh, anyway, but you probably have bigger problems, but uh, <laughs> you can, the big sense, right? Uh, anyway, it's use an ORM. Like, so the way to fix this, the easiest thing I have a comment about here, if we just use any framework right there, EF will take care of it. If somebody tries to, uh, any framework will escape the data using a approved, validated by security researchers way smarter than me um, to make sure that nobody can insert arbitrary data into your SQL app, right? Um, the other way of doing it, and I have it under here under SQL, and then SQL examples, <coughs> is, you know, .NET itself, if you, if you have to, maybe you can't use any framework because your lead architect is stuck in 1986 and hates ORMs or whatever, hates Sprocks. Uh, you can go to use, like, if you're using .NET again, uh, using SQL parameters. So this right here is using SQL parameter, the ADO.NET SQL parameter um, methods, and that will go ahead and take care of it for you as well. Those also automatically uh, won't allow arbitrary injection of code. Yeah, we'll flip back. You guys can see my delightful Hubble deep space thing, which, unfortunately, Oh, also, we're all talking about Rush Roulette on my computer right now. It's been blue screening for the last like four days. So I want everybody to cross their fingers because I think I got a bad RAM stick and I'm a couple thousand dollars from home. So let's, <laughs> let's all hope it keeps going. All right. So again, here's where we protect against, right? So the general protection, and these are again our on OS sites, are user parameterized API. Almost all of these things have parameterized APIs. Um, escape using special characters. Um, there are a number of these if you have to, especially for LDAP and XPath, there are a number of uh, uh, libraries that will go ahead and escape all this for you. And uh, whitelist, right? The thing to do is to say, like, no, I'm not expecting, if, if I'm just paying a first name in, it shouldn't have anything but alphanumeric characters, right? But that is still can be abused if somebody's particularly smart. Um, again, for mine, we just we could add input and escape all, all user input. So, second, number two, broken authentication. Um, this is basically, so, I don't know why. HDMI is cutting off the edge, I'm sorry. Um, so, this is any authentication or, or session stage that is completely and totally white has flaws in it. How this usually manifests itself is people not, oh, you fixed it, thank you, Heather. Thanks, Heather. Uh, so, thanks to the prevalence of Bitcoin, uh, we now have custom built rigs that can run hundreds upon billions of hashes a second, and you can buy them for relatively cheap. This was not a thing a couple years ago. So that's one of the problems nowadays. So if you don't store your passwords in a secure manner using one of the secure um, key derived algorithms designed for that purpose, any generic Bitcoin cracker can probably run through your entire password database in a few seconds. Um, default administrative account lists, like you can get these anywhere, like any random unknown system you ever thought of, people have, will have collected lists of default users and passwords, um, dictionary attack tools, all the rest. It, it, or not locking you out, not requiring multi-factor, the list goes on and on and on. Um, you also get session management attacks. Um, user session is very important and it's usually, almost always in, in my experience, poorly implemented by developers. Uh, it's not taking into account that people can steal sessions and then get access, or it's not validating your session when you log in at somebody else's or, or something like this. I have seen this everywhere. Most recently, I worked on a big telecom in the United States, uh, one of the big four, and I mean, the list of ways this was broken goes on and on. My personal favorite was right when the iPhone 10 came out, they were, they had two authentication mechanisms, a legacy one and a newer uh, OAuth platform. Unfortunately, somebody hadn't secured the backend e-commerce servers um, and wasn't checking to see if both tokens were valid, only one, and the other authentication system had a vulnerability where you could just copy 
the like token from one computer to another and just use it. So some enterprising hackers had figured out they could steal Google's tokens and start ordering thousands of iPhones at a thousand dollars a piece. Um, and next thing you know, the company had lost. I, I, it was many billions of dollars in a very short amount of time until they figured it out. So that's just one example, right? This session off broken authentication. Um, what else we got here? Oh yeah. <laughs> the other one is somebody had figured out another company on this one. Uh, they had figured out that you could take a, a session cookie and it wouldn't expire for a year. So somebody injected, started infecting people's computers. Again, it was, a, it was a major site and started stealing people's session cookies and ordering stuff through them because you could just copy and paste it through anybody. You had you had hijacked your session, you now had access and you could place orders against the API. Um, the other one was about a year and a half ago. I was doing some work for a, a lottery system in the United States, and they decided let's secure this quarter billion dollar, you know, worth of like uh, lottery ticket winning winning scratch cards. I think we have those in Europe, right? Those scratch, scratch off tickets. <laughs> let's, let's secure that with a SHA-512 algorithm. For those who don't know, when I talk about Bitcoin, um, it, it like proof of concept on this laptop, which is not a Bitcoin rigging mining machine. I was able to brute force it in like the first couple in like about three hours. And, and a real Bitcoin mining machine could have brute forced that entire database in about 13 seconds. So those are just some examples, and that keeps going on and on and on, right? Broken authentication is extremely prevalent um, across the industry. So oh, the other one I like hitting is if this has ever happened to you, you know, you go to a website, and register, type in your email password, you forget your password within two years or forget my password. If that company emails you back the plain text version of your password, their, uh, their authentication system is not working. Um, the other way you see this too is arbitrary restrictions on passwords. If, if people are properly implementing password authentication and hashing, they shouldn't care how many, you shouldn't have to be restricted on no numbers or no special characters. A hash function does not care, right? It, and so when I see stuff like that, I know they're doing something silly. Um, so let's see what this looks like, right? So the easiest way to take a look at this one is to see what it looks like when we see um, a password hash. So again, the cheat sheet has a great series on this. There you go. Broke that navigation. Cheat sheet has a great series on this. If you ever need to store passwords in any sort of fashion or, or handle user authentication, there is a great .NET specific as well as Java and all the rest. Cheat sheets on how to properly do this. Okay. So, Specifically, this is using, this looks great. And by the way, I've seen code just like this about four times in the last two years. Um, <laughs> ripped from today's headlines. This looks great, like, oh, look at this, all oh, this is great, right? We're encrypting, looks fine, like you're storing it. Like, what's the casual glance doesn't look problematic. The issue is, is this using, there's two forms of encryption. There's symmetric encryption, which means I can encrypt something and then get the value back pretty easily, assuming I have the key for it. And there's asymmetric encryption, also known as hashing, which means once I run it through a hash function, getting the value back, unless we get quantum computing, if you guys see the keynote, I mean, we're all screwed. Uh, but, uh, unless, unless I have um, the original, it's really difficult to derive the value back. A hash is a one way function, it, you can't really go back. So this is terrible because this is encrypting and saving it to a database, and so maybe anybody who grab access to the key would be able to actually go ahead and decrypt the entire thing and have it know that everybody's using names and passwords. The proper way to save a user and password is using what's called a key-derived function. Um, .NET hasn't built in, so most other languages. This one is called PD2KDF. It's RFC2898 is what it's, I don't know why Microsoft called it there, just for delightful reasons, I guess. But these functions are explicitly designed to run a ton of hashes all in sequence to just make it computationally intensive to try to brute force it. So in particular, this guy right here, it runs how many iterations of SHA-512. The minimum recommended is something like 20,000. So it's going to run 20,000 picking of SHA hashes of the password, which means, like on my laptop, it takes about 300 milliseconds for this function to run, right? But that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to make it prohibitively inexpensive for somebody to try to brute force crack hash. Because again, with Bitcoin mining rings, it can run billions upon billions of hashes a second. You have to do stuff like this. Um, so this is the proper way of quote unquote storing a password. Is run in ways nice. There's another one called Below uh, Blowfish. Here I'll have another key drive function you can use as well. All right. Let us. Uh, 
that's what that. Again, password stuff is 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 difficult, um, just in general for about everybody. So I would always encourage you to take a look at again these cheat sheets and these type of stuff near where you need to implement something like this. Again, do stuff like salt to prevent dictionary or rainbow attacks and all the rest. So here's here's some protections. Um, OWASP has um, a verification system where they'll say, does your session authentication match? If it does, is it good? Um, use a well-known implementation. I say this, but people still run their own auth schemes to this day, even though we have 1,900 versions of good authentication systems that you can buy. Still, I see it. Um, use a che cheat sheets, forgot password cheat sheets, and session management cheat sheets to validate your implementations, if you, if you have to. Um, and then there are some, this is a U.S. government National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, but they implement a basic password best practices. Like these are the things you should do to force your users to have good passwords, not force your users to have passwords they have to write down a piece of paper to email it to their monitor, right? Uh, anyway, to fix it, yeah, use PB2 data. Sensitive data exposure. All right, so what this means is anytime we're exposing something that shouldn't be encrypted to somebody. Okay? The example from literally yesterday was, did anybody get an email from Twitter yesterday? Yeah. Twitter was storing everybody's passwords, plain text on a log somewhere. That is sensitive data exposure. Um, again, it's, I swear, every time I do this talk, right before some big security headline hits, I think the last time I did it was one big virus or something like that. Um, anyway, sensitive data exposure is anytime something that should be encrypted is being left unencrypted on box or, or anywhere, right? So a personal example with this, a couple different places, um, besides the Twitter headline from yesterday, we have uh, an e-commerce platform that transacts, you know, around 10 million credit card people, a, a, you know, a year. All those credit card numbers were being written to disk on some servers. And until for about a year and a half, until somebody like checked the logs, which is another problem entirely, don't get me wrong. It was like, hey, what are all these credit cards doing here, guys? Um, lucky enough, those servers, it was caught, there was no breaches, it was able to be wiped, but, but still, um, a good example of sensitive data exposure. Another one is when I worked at the state government, somebody had left. So backup tapes are, tapes happen. Like, even with clouds, there's still, somebody had to backup data, tapes happen. Uh, somebody had left and it lost for about 17 hours, like about 15 terabytes of backup data, which include like basically every citizen in the state's very personal data until they found it they had misplaced in their own house, thank goodness, they're taken away from offsite backup. Um, but all that type of stuff counts as sensitive data exposure, right? Targets exposure of credit card data would fall under this one, since they were allowing uh, unencrypted credit cards to go across their network that a vendor had access to. So it's, uh, how explicit it is is, like I said, usually it's attackers are doing, you know, manual attacks, getting access to a server, looking at logs. That there's hunt for this stuff that should be stored in plain. You look at databases that aren't encrypted on data, stuff like that, right? Um, usually it's manual, right? Um, usually it's it's people going out and, and just exploring. Um, the most common is people not encrypting stuff. It's it's 2018. Even for the Microsoft stack, it's easier than ever to encrypt stuff, and the Java stack same. But still, people just aren't encrypting data. And that's probably the most common place to see this. You know, I still go to companies and see their backend APIs are talking to each other across HTTP instead of HTTPS. And, well, the network's secure. Well, I mean, is it, guys? Is it? Um, probably not, is the answer to that one. Probably, almost certainly not. Um, and we password again. People still use ancient password storage mechanisms using old, like, SHA-1 or SHA-2 hashes instead of the new KDF stuff. So the impact is severe, right? Usually what happens is, Stuff, usually when you're this kind of stuff, it's, you're exposing something they should have access to. So it's getting access to credit cards, personal data, all that type of stuff, all the bad. And nowadays, it's usually legal actionable, you know, between GDPR and other privacy regulations. Uh, this stuff is pretty bad when you let it happen, be exposed. So, um, an example of this is, I've seen this one pretty, pretty commonly too. Let me flip over here. So this is, and this, by the way, I didn't modify, um, but thanks, Twitter. So this is the email, if anybody didn't see that, we all got from one of the lads at one, but this is the email we all got just like yesterday from Twitter. Hey, so by the way, we uh, accidentally were logging your password to this. Like, oopsie. Like, you're like, how does something like this happen, Twitter? Well, it's because of stuff like this in here, which I've done, I did almost a year ago, but uh, remains ever, 
ever present because of how people write applications. Great. Um, here's a great example. So I've seen this before numerous times where a Okay, good. So this is pretty, look pretty benign, right? I'm, I'm just trying to log the fact I'm creating a user. User two string looks great. Nothing about this looks odd at first glance. Until you look at this, the user two string method, where if you take a oh, for Pete's sake. Let's let's not try to go to controller based Microsoft. So, sometimes Visual Studio, sometimes okay. we'll do it the hard way. Except somebody had overwritten user string to be really helpful and then decided to log in the password. So it, it's, it's that type of stuff, and, and I've seen this example before. I don't know if this is exactly what happened on Twitter. Usually it's some sort of logging framework that's maybe intercepting the HTTP request and logging out the body or, or that type of thing. But if this type of stuff, that will kill you, right? Nobody realizes that they're typing two string logs in the password, but in fact it does. Um, so the, the correct way of doing something like this, the way to fix it is to do you know, something like this. The other way I've seen, if you're using one of the popular logging frameworks like Log4Net or Elm or one of the rest, you can use filters on those um, that will look for specific patterns and they see them on the mask them. Like a lot of times I'll use those for social security numbers or um, again, I'll show them for like nine digit strings. Those aren't foolproof, but it might save you in case junior replacement level dev decides to try to log out passwords for some reason. You try to troubleshoot them with local or whatever. Whatever reason they decide, it's a, it's a great idea to do that. Right. Uh, yeah, another real life example is somebody emailing me my password. So I, I, I use a uh, I, I use a password like last pass for my passwords and I was like thanks guys. That's I'm really glad I did that. Um, XML external entity. So this is one of the brand new ones from this year. So XMC we've sort of moved on to JSON now. Right? I think most people, it, legacy SOAP exists, um, and unfortunately it exists in the place where hackers like to target the most, which is big enterprises, usually on complicated backend systems. Um, and unfortunately, XML has this great slash horrible thing you can do where you can specify a document type definition saying, hey, load this external resource. Now, it's designed to do stuff like you're trying to format a document and put in pictures, or maybe a link to something to click on, and all the rest. That's what the original spec was. Nobody really thought, what happens if I give somebody a payload, like a SOAP payload, and give it a document type definition that say points to Etsy password, or some random file system on the thing? Like, what happens then? The answer is most legacy XML processors will execute that and spit you back the results of the Etsy password, or any arbitrary thing on the server. And that includes most things of .NET prior to version 4.5. Like XML document will, XML text reader will, all of them will, if they, if they, unless you turn off this specific things. So, like I said, as you know, the premise is many older, almost all of them, from, from what the um, researchers have found out, let you do this. So, if you have a web service or something that accepts XML, it's an older client, you're probably vulnerable to this. Um, so, and unfortunately, those are usually the hardest systems to fix, which is in their home entirely. So, <laughs> how they're usually used is to extract data. Right? Usually what you're doing is you're pointing, you're saying XDT, yeah, DTT, go ahead and grab me something off that local web server where this is running. However, in, in certain particularly terribly maintainer patch systems, you could use it for arbitrary code execution. Right? There, there is in theory a path to execute a file on that system or an executable and give it a payload and then do so. Um, it would be more difficult to check, but it's still definitely possible. And the impact can be pretty severe, right? That server is hosting your database and somebody's spitting it out to you or whatever. That's problematic, right? So, the easiest way to fix this, <laughs> my favorite, this is poll from a lot, don't use XML, use JSON. It's like, nope, <laughs> all right, it sounds good. I think, I think most of us are on board with that. Um, again, most of the newer libraries, um, since this came out about two years ago, most of the newer libraries now shut this off by default, and they just won't allow you to do it. Um, and the other way to do it is to disable XML to the DTD processing. So the quick way, I'll, I'll start to be quick about these um, updates since we're running a teeny bit short on time here. The, the quickest way to do that for .NET is, where is it? Did you get the screen here? So again, if you use the newest stuff, you're probably okay. But the one thing that can get you here 
So this is an example, this is pulled from the other side. This is an example of what this looks like, this attack looks like. So this is the key part here, this DTD. So I'm saying, hey guys, in my local which our XML, go ahead and execute this test, or insert this text.txt text here. If an option isn't turned off, XML will gladly do so. This is built in the processor, it's built in the spec, that's how it's supposed to work. Now this is a test document, but of course, again, I can point to any arbitrary document on the file system. So the way to fix this, there is an XML reader and an XML document, all the generic.NET classes, and, and most of the generic Java classes too. There's this DTD processing element, or parse DTD, or something like that. If it's set to parse, it'll do this, and you'll have problems, right? It'll execute that. By default nowadays, though, if you or if you change this to, um, to the dot none, it will ah, or don't deny. My, great, my typing doesn't work. I think it's denied. Uh, it won't actually go ahead and execute this. It'll throw an exception. So if somebody tries to give you an arbitrary XML template payload that has an XML need to be defined, it'll throw an exception. Dot net won't process it, log it out, and you'll be safe. But again, this is only on the newer version of frameworks. There is a link at the very end to a, um, so did a big analysis of all the different XML classes in .NET and what, what versions they started becoming safe and what versions they weren't. And for the most part, if you're, if you're on 4.6 or core, you're okay, but there are some exceptions to that rule. Unless, again, you're overriding it explicitly like this, which might be okay, but if you're doing that, um, you probably need to take extra precautions if you're, so you're not accepting arbitrary payloads across the internet. Otherwise, somebody will have access to everything they could possibly want on that machine's file system. Okay. Ah. There we go. Broken access control. Um, how this usually manifests itself, and how the easiest way to test it for, is you require authentication, that's great. But then you don't do anything past that. Um, where I usually see this is like random APIs. Right, so the easiest way, I just saw this, there's a, a straw that's around here too, it's actually a Swedish based company. Strava, it's a, I, you know, I don't look like it, I buy it quite a bit, and uh, it's an exercise tracking, tracking app. Well, you query their APIs, like most, what would be like, you know, get user ID, activity number, spits you back to activity RAM. That's great, all that requires authentication, but once you're authenticated, I can send any arbitrary, or you say, do they fix it? Send any arbitrary user data to it, as a user ID, and it just sends me back that user's information. And you see this all over the place, right? It's just randomly hitting APIs, giving them an ID or something like that, and then they're not checking to see, wait, should Bill really have access to this information? Um, the other one you can see, that's, you also see it sometimes with like file systems, uh, rarely internally, where, hey, we let you log on, but once you log on, you can access anything, right? So, it's usually, usually um, one of the first things that an attacker looks for is they see if I'm authenticated, what can I do? Start hitting, access, try hitting access to things and then try to get privileged access, right? Seeing if, if I can pull additional data I have. So exploitability is usually pretty easy. Um, it's actually pretty common, um, usually just because where I see it most is, again, junior replacement level dev forgets to add the correct like authentication or authorization headers on a web API. Right, or does it properly implement user control based um, for authentication methods, or I mean, uh, API methods, that type of stuff. Um, the, the technical impact depends on your API, right? It might be nothing, or it might be just leaking, just leaking of user data. It could be very, very, very severe. The worst case I've ever seen of this was an API where they forgot to um, secure the reset password function of their API, which means I could send, once I authenticated, I can hit the reset password, give it, I don't know, administrator as a username, and it would send me back the new password they helpfully reset for me. So I now had access to everything on the entire site. Um, so it's that type of stuff that keeps up at night, but at the same time, it could be accessed to all sorts of different things. And it usually is, user data, maybe you can access the price orders to another person, that's not uncommon either. Uh, so where do you usually see this type of stuff is, again, like I said, I'm gonna skip on the example, we're all on time, but Again, API controls that they just aren't, don't, they require authentication, don't require authorization. They don't require to check to see, should I really be allowed to do this? Um, again, the protections, check access on every action, and use per session or per user references, which, say I have, uh, my norm in my API is like, get such user and then give it an ID, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The other way of doing that is to turn those into get slash user slash one, 
or if every user is one, and then internally you link that number one to a user session ID. You keep all that stuff in the database, or like a GUID or something like that. Less secure, but is still a way of securing it. For some reason, you can't. Um, security misconfiguration. This is a pretty broad group, but it's basically what happens when you install SQL Server and you leave the username SA with the password blank, right? Or, or you uh, you install whatever any random app. This is the most common. Everybody's parents. If I go to your guys' parents' house, I'm guessing their router password is set to admin admin or admin blank or admin password, right? And, and probably some of you in the room, but I'll, I'll leave the. Uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll leave you guys. You don't have to incriminate yourself. Uh, but by the way, that's common in major corporations. Like I've seen default usernames and passwords on core routers, right, for financial institutions, because nobody will get access to them to that VLAN. I mean, sure, right. So anyway, this is this stuff is pretty common. Um, it, it usually involves that stuff, right? Unprotected files, directories, uh, anything at all that somebody just doesn't run the security best practices through, like the hardening does, essentially. Um, so these are common due to lack of automated detection, but they are actually able to be detected pretty easily. Most of the common penetration suites will go ahead and like, are you exposing port 80 somewhere? They will try to log on to it through every known version of password and so on and so forth. So they can be detected okay, um, but they are also still pretty common. And their impact is, it, it depends, right? If, if somebody just leaves, I don't know, a, a random like environmental control unprotected, that's what I'm saying, like HVAC system unprotected, which is pretty common, maybe somebody's gonna screw the temperature. On their hand, if somebody leaves your core router misconfigured, they can then mirror your ports and get everything, every piece of data transferred across your network forwarded to them. Um, where I've seen this most often, to this day, in the year of our Lord, 2018, is people don't turn on Windows patching, right? It, it's 2018 and people still don't have Windows patching turned on, which causes all sorts of issues. Every time a virus comes out, um, I mean, three, four, five years service in the DMZ with any patches, stuff like that. Um, as the other one I've seen as well is, like I said, it's often on the core low-level stuff. I used to be an infrastructure guy, so maybe that's part of it. But like, I'll so often go see like SANs and routers with like admin, admin blank as the default password. It's like, oh, I hope no one ever figures out they can plug in the network switch on that VLAN port and get access because, well, boy, um, that's that's usually where you see this one. So the yeah, other where we see it as developers, and I'll get on a secret demo, is stack traces leaking to users. Stack traces leaking to users is considered a, a misconfiguration, right? Because if you're leaking stack traces, that stack traces that can give an awful lot of information to your user. Um, including environment variables, it can include everything, you know, like how your, what your program actually is. I can look at pretty much any arbitrary stack trace and almost immediately determine that C sharp, right? Or that's Python, or that's Java. Java, because it's 700 pages long. Uh, sorry, I had to dig Java there just briefly. Um, or, or any of that type of stuff, right? So that alone helps people exploit vulnerabilities. Um, really badly configured stack traces um, will do stuff like. <laughs> I saw this two and a half years ago. Sorry, something to juggle. Some developer must have been having issues talking to a SQL server. So he helpfully, when the stack trace bubbled out from a DB connection, included the username and password he was trying to connect to that SQL server with, so he could help troubleshoot his issues. Uh, that, was, that was great on so many different levels. Uh, anyway, other way is security misconfiguration, not using HTTPS, right? Again, it's 2018. Let's all use HTTPS, an example of security misconfiguration. So, protections. Patch your damn system. Uh, <laughs> desired state configuration. Using tools such as Docker and Puppet, um, all that type of stuff to basically, when I set up a system, enforce the security of that system through automated configuration. It doesn't become a, a unicorn. Somebody's not just having to go into a router or an IES server and configure all the security stuff manually. It's all done through a log and audited trace using one of these tools. Um, follow guidelines on server hardening, separate application roles, you know, reduce service attack, remove features. You don't need Telnet server probably installed in 2018, stuff like that. Uh, Cross-site scripting. So this is number seven. This used to be much higher, but developers have gotten a little bit better about this as the years have gone by. So what cross-site scripting is, um, how, there's two different versions. Um, it involves being able to inject, usually through the URL, an arbitrary like script, JavaScript that can be executed on the page for a user. Okay? 
That's called reflected XSS. So where you might see that is Johnny Hacker sends my mom a Twitter link, because my mom clicks on everything, because that's what moms do. And that Twitter link is actually, um, has contains the JavaScript code on it, it's designed to mimic an action on her. So maybe it's directing her to a bank website and then trying to send the account number to the attacker. Or log on to something else and reset the password and submit to the attacker. But it's because the web page will allow, and how you usually see this for reflect at least, is how many times we grab stuff out of the URI. I have to grab query parameters, grab whatever, and take that data and do something with it. Extremely common. However, if you take that data and insert it somewhere in the DOM, and then that DOM is processable, well, then it'll be executed like any other random JavaScript that does on the page. Um, the most other way of doing this is called reflected XSS. So reflected XSS is a similar thing, right? Except usually it's stored in the server. So where you commonly see this is I go on a website, in the blog comments, I start typing JavaScript, any JavaScript. Particularly terrible systems will take that JavaScript to save the database, and every time a user logs out into those comments, it's going to execute whatever arbitrary JavaScript that is put in the comments, which is bad. Seems easy. The most famous example of this was, it's been like seven years now, MySpace back in the day when, when MySpace was still a thing before Facebook had become our supreme overlords. Uh, somebody discovered MySpace comment section was vulnerable to XSS. It was required a bit more than that, but it, was, it still was. And he made a very simple one that just basically said, if a user posted, uh, executed, user loaded, ran as a user, added this guy as their friend, and made a comment post saying, like, hey, this guy is awesome. And it just rippled out through the entire MySpace network. And in about seven hours, this guy had more followers or more friends, sorry, than uh, like the head of MySpace. Again, it's pretty, pretty benign in its effect, but it could have been a lot worse. Um, so, here is what this looks like. I'm going to show this one because it's one of the hard ones, I think, personally, to get your head around. Um, when I take point, just kind of figure out what exactly we mean. So, let's look at our views and blog entries. Check my cheat sheet here. Alright, here's what this looks like. Whatever it says, prop. Okay. You see this all the time, right? I'm going to grab this, this script tag down here. If you guys see it, I'm going to blow it up. I'll blow it up a little bit. I'm going to go to 120%. 150%. Oh, that's huge. Okay, great. All okay. right. So you see this sort of quite often, right? I'm going to grab the location and and I'm going to go ahead and say, like, oh, the location should have the person's name. So let's just, you know, I'm going to insert a welcome tag, welcome bill. Right. It's pretty common. Unfortunately, because of how I did this, and by throwing it in XML, somebody could have inserted any arbitrary JavaScript and the page would have executed it. So it looks benign, right? Just grabbing them, some by equal, trying to get a query parameter here, and I'm grabbing what I think is a name. In reality, a malicious attacker could insure, insert a script tag in there or any payload they wanted in that URI that the user could click on. And when this line right here in 62 runs and inserts in the doc, in your HTML, the browser will happily parse that and will happily execute that script. Which can be benign, right? It could be just mild stuff, but it can also be like, oh, you're authenticated to a website like your bank. You know, it can do all sorts of stuff like scrape the site for your bank account number, try to send money, all that type of stuff. Um, there's a lot of different ways of protecting against this. The, one of the easiest ways, air HTML is considered executable by the DOM. Text content is not. So if I had just switched this to use text content, it wouldn't have actually, they could insert any whatever script stuff they wanted in there, it wouldn't have ever worked. Again, don't ever do this, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> but this, this is how it also works again for like SQL, right? If I was able to, if I just randomly let a user insert any arbitrary stuff in my comment section without running it through an escape library or something like that, which .NET will do for you by default, by the way. MVC by default escapes, right? That's why we try to avoid using .raw and stuff like that. It's by default, we'll escape out those characters and just input it on the page and cause the same problem. Let me go ahead and blow this guy back up. So the easiest protection against it is, again, there's a cheat sheet. Um, content security policy, which is a cool browser security mechanism which basically says for this page, only allow content to execute from these particular sources. It's pretty advanced, but it's kind of cool. I just urge you to check it out if you're familiar with it. Again, never insert untrusted data, and then use frameworks that support automatically escaping 
uh, by design. Like an HDM, you can see that as Angular does, React does, and by default they all escape it. You have to do stuff like do dot raw on .NET to force it to not escape data. In security serialization, is another new one. So what I mean by security serialization is think of everybody's most favorite .NET library, uh, JSON .NET. Okay, we take we we have an endpoint that accepts arbitrary data from somebody. And we deserialize that and turn it into a real object, right? Turn take it from JSON, deserialize it, turn it into an object. Seems pretty benign. Unfortunately, it is not. Um, depending on the deserialization library, if they're not set up correctly, a user can cause you to execute an arbitrary object in the framework, which can lead to really poor, bad problems. Um, this affected Java more than it has affected .NET to date, although .NET is still vulnerable to it. So, this was also included, by the way, it's considered rare right now, although I think that'll change. Uh, it was included by ask of industry experts, not by its prevalence in the wild, which is why it's a little bit, low, uh, a little bit lower than the list. So think of your endpoint, right? I'm taking a JavaScript, I'm taking it in JSON, I'm taking like a user, posting a user to an endpoint. Seems easy, I'm serializing the data, putting it to a user object. Well, Johnny Jr. Dev, decides to add a object property on that just for arbitrary data. Who knows why they did it? They were too lazy to write a class, right? Writing classes is hard. Um, if you had some of the libraries set up improperly, when you, if an attacker learns you did that, they can cause that object to become any object in the framework by crafting the serialization payload. So that can make that become load assembly. They can execute arbitrary DLLs on your his attack. They can cause it to become system to IO like file system which lets them read arbitrary data on your file system. Any assembly in the framework they can use to start it up and run that assembly or construct a new object, right? Here is what this looks like. So this, again, is a new one. It's not in the wild that much. With that said, it is also really difficult to get to work correctly. Uh, I spent a couple hours, actually more like eight hours, playing around with the different um, examples and you know, suggested attack vectors before I could find one that sort of worked. Okay. I'm gonna show you what the postman looks like first. Okay. Uh, everybody see that sort of okay? I don't know a way to blow it up on postman. <laughs> so I'm saying, this is what I'm saying across the wire, right? I'm setting the type, which is the important thing, and I'm saying, hey, run system.io.file system. And then system.file system, set the file name to test.txt, .test. okay? Pretty easy. The issue is here, this object I'm expecting, this feed, is expecting just a generic object. It doesn't have to be the object too. So when json.net runs, it'll try to instantiate a system.io.file system because hey, that fits the definition of object, or dynamic in this case, it should be okay. Which will cause it to execute arbitrary payload, in this case, load test.txt, which is here on the root of the, uh, of the project, which isn't anything terrible in this case, but I mean, imagine somebody did this against connection strings, or, or whatever, right? They can pick any arbitrary thing. And again, this is just system not a file system. There's plenty of other stuff in the framework that lets you load DLLs and executables and all the rest. Uh, the way to fix this is, is there, uh, for one, by the way, when this first came out, quite a few libraries immediately were completely, basically had to be shut down because they just allowed it by default and there was no easy way to fix them. So the way to fix that, there's this, by default nowadays, JSON.net is good to go. If you're using a later version of JSON.net, you're A-OK. -okay. It, it, when, when it sees a type like this come across, it's like, no, I'm not going to try to instantiate an arbitrary type. You're going to get a blank object, and that's all you're going to get. However, oftentimes, junior random devs be like, well, that's annoying. I want to put an arbitrary object in here because I'm whatever. And so if they turn this to auto, then that overrides those default settings. And JSON then will try to instantiate any arbitrary object to give it in the JSON payload, which is problematic. Because at that point, again, a user can do effectively anything you can do with any assembly in .NET that you can pass in, like structure parameters or load something which is many of them. Uh, there's a couple proof of concept uh, PDFs on this out there that are linked to the end that I would encourage you if you're interested in this and see if you want to see if you're vulnerable, take a look at. They kind of go into, it's called gadget payloads is what it's called in the industry terms. So that is, 
And secure. I, I actually haven't seen this, although now that I know about it, I know quite a few of my applications that are vulnerable to it. Um, with that said, usually updating the payload takes care of it. So the easiest way to fix it, again, is, and there's a nice a link to it, is stick to a well-known framework that by default don't allow. Like this, again, the, the newer default.net frameworks don't allow this. They, they by default are, are safe, right? There are, are ways to implement integrity checks. So if I'm sending data to the user and expect that data to come back unmodified, to stuff like hash map to verify an uh, attacker hasn't tried to modify the payload before it comes back to you. Um, there's also ways to implement strict whitelists, like, okay, I will allow only these four types to come back, not every type, et cetera, et cetera, right? I think stuff like run deserialization of low access threads, i.e. don't use IES running a system, which happens this day because people do stuff. Uh, A9, use components with no vulnerabilities. So this, this kind of falls on the same thing, right? So <laughs> this is when people use old version of the components, right? Old NuGet packages, old NPM packages. There's plenty of NPM packages that XSS and CRI server attack vulnerabilities don't. Um, this is really widespread, right? People don't, it's where I build my .NET project and see anybody has updated the NuGet packages since the project was first set up. And, and oftentimes that includes security vulnerabilities that haven't updated. Uh, now, how vulnerable your app is to it might depend on those security vulnerabilities don't impact you because of something you're not using that part of the framework. But it's still pretty common. Um, and the impact is usually pretty bad, right? So if a user can, that usually means they can do something, whether it's execute arbitrary code or read something through your file system. So an example, you know, .NET has over 106 of these. Just an, an easy way of like, or an easy example of something like this, and there's three different JSON serializers and two different XML parsers that are, again, all vulnerable to like XML, like XXE attacks which we covered in A4, and those JSON packages which we covered in A8. Just some mild examples of security flaws. Like .NET new configuration familiar that framework was vulnerable to JSON deserializations. Uh, Insufficient attack or logging monitoring, aka the Snowden rule. Um, <laughs> this comes across because very few companies, or very few people, usually have a really good preventive measure set up for logging and monitoring. They're not checking their logs rarely, or if they're even logging something, they're done auditing set up on, on privilege access, they don't have any of that type of stuff set up. Um, because they don't have that stuff set up, it's difficult to determine when an attacker is doing something they shouldn't be doing, or a user is doing something they shouldn't be doing. Like, you know, downloading the entire NSA database. Um, or, or, like, just probing your application for vulnerabilities, or any of that type of stuff. So, when this happens, it's, to say the least, problematic. Um, it's hard to detect. Right, how do you detect your application is logging and auditing stuff? You have to log, go in there and take a look at it, right? How do I detect that I am properly when a user does something that authenticates them or gives them access to prove it logging it? You have to go look at the code. So it's pretty hard to detect um, just from a casual glance at it. Um, again, almost every, the impact of this is almost every successful attack starts with some sort of probing. Even if it's just like, hey, what version of IS are you running? Or are you even running IS? Almost all of them do. So these types of tools help prevent those type of issues. Um, so I'm going to skip the code demo again, we're going to a time, but <laughs> the biggest way we did this, we, we, we were logging authentication authorization. It's one of the easiest things you should be doing. Um, the easiest way to protect against stuff is use a well-known logging, uh, logging auditing framework. Um, you know, Log4Net or Elma if you're a .NET person. Um, there's an audit.net, which is actually this project, which is a cool third party that lets you audit like DB actions just is built in and logs out you know logged in username time what data is being passed it's really great it's really pretty cool um, make sure that you're using maybe one of the third party tools that are playing out there I, I don't want to throw any particular ones that lets you set up alerting right maybe so you're logging ten thousand times you'll be able to learn about that um, there's quite a few of them out there especially for Windows um, all the cloud frameworks have those alerting tools set up as well and you know, the other one to do is check the logs. Um, my favorite example of this is uh, the state, when I worked at the state, we had somebody trying to log out very long for like 45,000 attempts, so we just didn't go ahead and just check the logs. It's like, oh, that person's account is probably compromised. But you know, that often happens. That's why the learning is important, right? So it's an incident report, uh, incident report um, responses and that type of stuff. Uh, again, the, the, the biggest thing for this is really a, a save yourself, right? Is really to make sure that you don't run into issues. Um, resources. Again, this has uh, the cheat sheets, screen the framework. Um, Troy Hunt, if you guys uh, 
He did a version of this for 2013 version. So if you saw the touch legacy web forms, for one, I'm sorry. But for number two, uh, Troy has actually done the old version of this for web forms, if you're curious. Um, any organ is curious in the old version. 2013 had a couple things that don't exist on this version anymore because we've kind of solved them. Um, JSON of Texas is a, a really good uh, Oracle security, I think it was Oracle security researchers, when they did a massive free call Friday 13th release of all how badly vulnerable Java.net and Python were to these deer serialization attacks. It's a great paper, I highly encourage you to read it. And again, the cheat sheets and all the rest. And thank you everyone for coming. Enjoy the rest of your very sunny day. <laughs>